for joining us for the CLE today. My name is Anna Rainey. I'm the Business Development Manager at Polston Tax. My team is in charge of inbound and outbound referrals for the firm. Polston Tax is a tax resolution law firm and full service accounting firm with over 100 employees helping people with their tax issues all over the United States. Our speaker today is Rachel Pappy. She's the partner and attorney here at Polston Tax. She was in the accounting world before she became an attorney and realized her passion in helping people with their tax issues and loves what she gets to do every day. Rachel has a long list of accolades, but I'm gonna just share a couple of my favorites. She was the recipient of the Young Outstanding Alum Award from her law school. She's a best-selling author for the book, Get in the Game with Kevin Harrington. She was chosen by the IRS to speak on a nine-part seminar. She speaks all over helping businesses with their tax structure and teaching about and educating about the tax code. After I introduce Rachel, I'm gonna hop off and I'm gonna be behind my computer. So if anyone has any questions during the presentations, please feel free to chat me. And without further ado, please help me welcome Rachel Pappy. Thank you. Hello, are we all excited to talk about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act today? Thank you so much for being here. Now let's get started. Now, all five of these households I picked from distinct locations all across the country. The cement layer is in Livonia, Michigan. The teacher is in Lexington, Kentucky. The married filing joint couple, they're in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. The high-end real estate broker is in South Florida, Pembroke Pines, Florida, and the uh, Household making $1.5 million is in Venice, California. The reason I picked five different locations across the country is so we can see at different income levels, assuming all the households have four children, different filing statuses, and different states with different state income taxes and property taxes, how these changes are gonna affect them. The topics we're, gonna con the topics we're going to cover today include the repeal of the personal exemptions, the increase of the standard deduction, the repeal of the P's limitations, the limitation of state and local taxes, and modifications to the mortgage interest write-off, new education benefits under the 529 plans, the increased child tax credit, and the reduced or changed tax brackets. As we consider each one of these topics, until we get to the end of it and look at the reduced tax brackets, we're gonna consider each item and change individually. So as we examine the effect of the repeal of the personal exemptions, we'll see if there was a net loss or a net gain to the individual household. Then when we go to the increase of the standard deduction, we're not gonna combine the benefit or the loss of the repeal of the personal exemptions combined with the increased standard deduction. Instead, we're only going to consider the increase of the standard deduction standing alone and how it affects that household, if there's going to be a loss or a gain to the taxes due. Does that make sense? So here are the five uh, individuals I had outlined. The first is named Gideon, files his tax return as single, four kids in public school, rents an apartment, has no mortgage, which is important because of the mortgage interest write-off, works as a cement layer, earns $35,000 per year. In all of the examples, they're making charitable contributions that are equal to 10% of their gross income. So he is contributing $3,500 and he lives in Livonia, Michigan. In my second example is, the ca is Cassius, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. Four kids, rents a house, no mortgage, works as a teacher, earns $50,000 a year doing that, charitable contributions of $5,000 a year, and like I said, lives in Lexington, Kentucky. Reggie and Rachel, filing their tax returns, married filing joint, Oklahoma City, husband is a budget systems manager, a network systems manager, earning $60,000, wife is a budget analyst, earning $50,000, Together, their household income is $110,000, charitable contributions of $11,000, and they do have a mortgage. They have a house with a mortgage of $250,000. In all of the examples, if there's a mortgage, they all have the same interest rate, which is a 4.75 interest rate, just so we can compare that interest rate against mortgage, differing mortgage values and how it'll affect their tax return. 4.75% interest rate, and we'll see how that's gonna affect their tax return as we get to that point. 
Shelby. He lives in Pembroke Pines, Florida. This is our real estate broker earning $385,000. The four kids in private school, and that's going to be important when we look at the education benefits he's going to have under the 529 plans. Again, he has a 4.75 interest rate on his $800,000 mortgage. Uh, he files single, and uh, he's in Pembroke Pines, Florida, and the reason I chose that state is no state income tax. So we can look at the differences between uh, the California example, which we'll look at next, with very high income tax, or Florida with no state income tax, and how those tax returns end up uh, changing at the end with the, with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And lastly, we have John and Sheba. They file their tax return married filing joint, four children in private school, $2.2 million mortgage with a 4.75% interest rate. They husband earns $1.2 million, wife earns $300,000. They make charitable contributions equal to 10% of their household income or $150,000. And like I said, they live in Venice, California. Another thing to note on this example is going to be the repeal of the P's limitations. Because of their income level, they, uh, surpa they passed the, uh, the threshold for income levels for the personal exemptions and for, the, um, and for the, uh, what they are able to take on their itemized deductions. And that makes a considerable difference when we look at uh, how, this how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will change their tax return. First, repeal of the personal exemptions. Personal exemptions are your ability to claim yourself, your spouse, and your dependents. In 2017, that amount was $4,050. When you are able to take that amount times the number of people you can claim, you take that number and reduce your taxable income by your personal exemptions. That reduces the total amount you'll owe in personal the, the total amount you'll owe in taxes. So when we look at Gideon, for example, he has four children and himself. He claims all five, and that results in personal exemptions of twenty thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. That leaves him with fourteen thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars of taxable income. With this being repealed and not being able to claim his children, it is a net loss to Gideon. Likewise, for Cassius, it's a loss for the same reasons. Not being able to claim himself and his children results in a net loss. By not being able to reduce his income by each exemption he could claim in 2017, for 2018, it's a net loss because now his income isn't reduced by this amount. For Reggie and Rachel, it's a net loss on the personal exemption point alone. Loss because they could have claimed their children and each other and reduced their taxable income amount by $4,050 for each individual they could claim. When we look at the example of Shelby, at $385,000, he actually exceeded the AGI for claiming the personal exemption. So repealing the personal exemption has no effect on this household and likewise no effect on the last household. The repeal of the personal exemption has no effect because they were unable to claim it in 2017 because their AGI surpassed uh, the amount, the threshold amount for claiming personal exemptions. Now, even though the personal exemptions may have been repealed, many people argue that that was offset by the increase of the standard deduction. The increase in the standard deduction is almost double. Single households, it increased from $6,350 to $12,000. Married filing joint households increased from $12,700 to $24,000. And for head of household, that increased change from $9,350 to $18,000. Now, what a standard deduction is, is if, you ins if instead of taking itemized deductions and claiming your mortgage interest, your state income tax, local taxes, property tax, um, child dependent care expenses, student loan interest, if those expenses are less than the standard deduction, you'd want to just take the standard deduction. So by increasing this amount, the standard deduction amount, we're now able to claim or reduce your taxable income. Your standard deduction works much like I explained with the personal exemption, where you take your gross income less the amount you can subtract or the standard deduction, and now you have a new net uh, taxable income. We'll see here in this example of Gideon. 
for Gideon, increasing that standard deduction is a net gain. This is standing alone again, not considering the repeal of the personal exemptions anymore, just looking at the increase of the standard deduction. So, whereas before, Gideon would have had charitable contributions of $3,400 and Michigan State income tax of $1,487, previously he would have been claiming that $6,350 as a standard deduction because his itemized deductions only come out to less than $5,000. Now, not only can he claim that $6,350, but the standard has increased to $12,000. So he reduces his taxable income from $35,000, less $12,000 for the standard deduction, to $23,000 of taxable income. For Gideon, this is a net gain on the standard deduction alone. Likewise for Cassius. Cassius had no mortgage. Lexington, Kentucky, income tax, at $50,000 of income is $2,836, charitable contributions of $5,000, and his state income tax, I'm sorry, his itemized deductions together are $7,836. In the past, Cassius might have claimed itemized deductions. If he was um, filing single uh, and taking that uh, $6,350 amount, or if he was claiming head of household, you would compare the standard deduction against the $7,836 of itemized deductions that he has. Now, head of household, he's able to subtract $18,000 as the new standard deduction that has increased. His new taxable income is $32,000 just using the standard deduction. This not only simplifies his tax return, but it's a boost over what he would have been able to claim before with by itemizing. For Cassius, not, in co not considering the repeal of the personal exemptions, standing alone, the standard deduction is a net gain. For Reggie and Rachel, there's no effect. The reason is, even though the married filing joint standard deduction has increased substantially, their itemized deductions still exceed the increase. Reggie and Rachel have a household earning $110,000 in Oklahoma City. Charitable contributions equal 10% of that, which is $11,000. They have a house with a $250,000 mortgage. The interest on that is, uh, per year is $11,875. Their Oklahoma State income tax is $4,900, or approximately $4,900, uh, not considering other deductions. Their property taxes in Oklahoma County are $2,625. Total, they have itemized deductions of $30,400. That would be in 2017 or in 2018. And thus, claiming the standard deduction of uh, $24,000 uh, is still less than their actual itemized deductions, and they would want to itemize. There's no net effect to Reggie and Rachel's tax return. Likewise, Shelby, who's the realtor in Florida, Charitable contributions are 18,000, I'm sorry, are $38,500. Mortgage interest on the $800,000 house is $18,287.50. Property taxes are $4,235. And like we said, he's in Florida, no state income tax. Even still, his, his itemized deductions are $61,022.50. So even with the increase of the standard deduction, he'd still want to itemize because his itemized deductions are more. Standard deduction he could have claimed was $12,000, and thus the $61,022.50 is greater. Net effect to Shelby is none. And as you can imagine, the same with John and Sheba. They could have claimed $24,000. Their charitable contributions alone are $150,000. And as we'll get to later, with the P's limitations now, they're able to claim all of their itemized deductions. Likewise, in the example with, with Shelby, previously those itemized deductions would have been limited by what's called the P's limitations. Now that's been repealed and they're able to claim all of their itemized deductions, even though uh, in 2017 they would have had to reduce it by the amount that their AGI exceeds an income threshold. So here we get to the P's limitations. In 2017 and prior years, total amount of allowable itemized deductions would be limited by, uh, with the exception of medical expenses, investment interest, and casualty theft, 
or gambling losses, was reduced by 3% of the amount by which the taxpayer's adjusted gross income exceeded the threshold amounts listed below. These amounts were divided by uh, filing status, single, married filing jointly, head of household, and married filing separately, and are these amounts listed above. But this new law, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, actually suspends the P's limitations between the years of 2018 to 2025. That's one point I should make here about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Although many of the tax cuts to the corporate taxes have been permanently implemented, many of the uh, changes to the personal income taxes are for a 10-year period of time after which they will sunset or expire. That includes this, the P's limitations having an expiration date right now set for 2025. But the repeal of the P's limitations does have an effect on the households who were previously limited. Gideon earned $35,000 per year. He was not limited by the P's limitations. Any itemized deductions he was claiming he could take and so there's no effect by this repeal. Cassius, likewise, was not, was not limited by the P's limitations. At $50,000 a year, he was able to claim all of the itemized deductions that he had. The repeal of the P's limitations have no effect. Reggie and Rachel, at married filing joint, household income of $110,000, they were not limited by the P's limitations. But when we look at Shelby, for example, he earned $385,000 and filed single. His itemized deductions were limited. They were limited as follows. $385,000 less the P's threshold for his filing status was $261,500. The difference was $123,500, and you would multiply that by 3%. That gives you $3,705. Thus, in previous years, or looking at 2017, as these numbers uh, are reflective of, Shelby would have been disallowed $3,705 of his itemized deductions. Now, under the new law, this is repealed, and he can claim his entire itemized deduction. So for Shelby and households that exceed that AGI threshold for the P's limitations, it's a net gain, standing alone. The same is true for John and Sheba, who make $1.5 million dollars, Filing, married filing jointly, their, their income exceeds the P's threshold by $1,186,200. You multiply that by 3%, and they lost $35,586 of their 2017 itemized deductions. Under the new law, they don't lose that. They can claim all of their itemized deductions. This is a gain for a lot of nonprofits who are concerned about the increase of the standard deductions, creating a situation where individuals are no longer worried about the write-off they're able to gain from contributing to a charity. Now they can claim the standard deduction, which has increased substantially, and because of that increase, they don't need to prove it through an itemized deduction. However, the repeal of the P's limitations eliminates the limitation that was previously set on high income earners, and now dollar for dollar, those individuals are able to contribute and write it off on their tax return. The net effect, I believe, could be a gain to the nonprofit world. Limitation of salt and mortgage interest. Now, these two pieces are not together in the law. They're only combined in this presentation to shorten and simplify the presentation. But the mortgage interest is a separate section and change in the law, and the uh, state and local tax modification or limitation to $10,000 is another section. Specifically, state and local sales tax plus real property taxes may be deducted, but only to a combined total of $10,000 or $5,000 if married filing separately. Likewise, interest on a new home mortgage is also limited. It's limited to interest paid on a maximum of $750,000 or mortgage interest on a mortgage of $375,000 if married filing separately. And these are on mortgages that are taken out after December 14th of 2017. Interest on a home equity loan is deductible only if those proceeds are used to make substantial improvements to the taxpayer's home. 
Furthermore, the combined total of the mortgage and the HELOC cannot exceed the new $750,000 limit on mortgage amounts qualified for the interest deduction. Taxpayers who have a mortgage taken out before December 15, 2017 may continue to claim the home mortgage interest deduction up to a million dollars as it was in 2017 and prior years or 500,000 if married filing so, uh, separately going forward. And one million dollars, uh, the one million dollar limit continues to apply also to refinance mortgages before December 15, 2017. This is actually a substantial change to the law on both sides. Capping state and local income taxes to $10,000 is going to hit a lot of households who have been claiming their full state and income uh, taxes as well as property taxes as a write-off on their tax return. Not only is that going to increase taxable income, but so too is having to use your home equity line of credit only for substantial improvements to the home. Historically, HELOCs, home equity line of credits, have been used for a wide assortment of needs, paying for a child's wedding, paying for a child to go to college, emergencies, medical expenses. Now, all of those would not qualify under this new change that requires that HELOC, written off on a tax return, must be used for substantial improvements to a taxpayer's home. We believe that there are going to be a lot of audits on this topic specifically to see how a HELOC was, was taken out and to ensure that the HELOC was applied to substantial improvements on a taxpayer's home. The word substantial can be considered vague and we believe that that is going to be a definition that will be argued over. It has not been more clearly defined yet at this point. When we look at SALT and the mortgage interest limitations and compare them against Gideon, who, remember, was renting an apartment so the mortgage interest doesn't affect him, and his state and local income taxes are under that $10,000 cap. So there's no net effect to Gideon whatsoever. He didn't pay over the $10,000, and so he is not capped by this change. On this point alone, Gideon still is able to write off the full $637.50 in state taxes if he was itemizing. But as we discussed before, he'll likely claim the standard because his itemized deductions are less than the new increased standard deduction. Likewise, Cassius, he's renting a house, so he has no mortgage interest. He has state taxes in Lexington, Kentucky, totaling $1,251.38. And thus, his itemized deductions could be taken off in full for the state and local tax of $1,251.38, which is still below the $10,000. But as we discussed before, he'll claim the standard and not itemize because of the new increased standard deduction. When we look at Reggie and Rachel, married filing joint household earning $110,000 in Oklahoma City. Their state and local income taxes are a total of $5,402.29, property taxes of $2,625. That totals $8,027.29. This is going to be dependent on the fair market value of their house and the property taxes that they are going to have to pay for that house or the acreage that they may have, as well as the amount of their household income which is going to drive the amount of their state income taxes. But at $110,000 in, an, in an, a house valued at $250,000, their state and local taxes, property taxes, are still less than the $10,000 threshold, which means they can claim all of it. Their mortgage interest is also an amount that they can claim uh, $11,875 for because it has not been impacted by the changes to the limitations on the mortgage interest. Reggie and Rachel thus, as we talked about before, itemize and they're able to claim their full itemized deductions and are not affected by these changes. Next, we look at a household like the one in Pembroke Pines, Florida. There's no state income tax, which is one reason I picked this, so we could see how this limitation on state and local income taxes will affect some households. 
no state income tax and property taxes. Remember, a fair market value home of $800,000. In Pembroke Pines, Florida, it came out to $4,235. With a cap of $10,000, he can claim the full $4,235. The mortgage interest in this example, the mortgage is $800,000. Now, I picked that number to make the, the point, if this house was purchased before December 14th, he would be grandfathered in. But per his filing status, if he purchased it after December 15th, 2017, he would now only be able to claim up to $750,000 interest on that mortgage or interest on a mortgage of $750,000. When we get to the end of this and we consider this example, we will believe that this example, in this example, he was grandfathered in prior to December 14th, 2017 and is able to claim the full mortgage interest of $38,000. The net effect to these two changes and limitations is none. When we look at the household in Venice, California, high income earner, Venice, California, high state income tax state, it is a net loss. Standing alone, when we look at the limitation of state and local taxes to ten, of $10,000, John and Sheba pay $156,000 $51.20 in state income tax alone. Limiting that to $10,000 means that they have lost over a hundred, nearly $150,000 in just their state income tax. Their property taxes are an additional $29,000. Total, they have $185,000 and 50, um, $185,000 $51.20 when we add together their state and local taxes plus their mortgage interest. Mortgage interest write-off, assuming again that they purchased the home before December 14th. If you recall, this is a household that had a $2.2 million mortgage on a house with a 4.75% interest rate. How the banks have previously sent the mortgage interest statements is to send the statement with the full amount of the mortgage. Even though the house was a $2.2 million mortgage, the household would receive an interest statement for the full amount of interest that was paid for the year. Previously, that mortgage interest was limited to a mortgage of a million dollars, which that's where you have a tax preparer calculate what the million dollar mortgage would be and the interest that would be paid on that. We anticipate that it will be the same for 2018. With the new limitations, the banks will likely continue to send the full interest that was paid and will be the responsibility of the tax preparers to calculate the application of the limitation on the mortgage interest against what was actually paid and what the mortgage is. The net effect to this household, Venice, California, high state income tax, high property taxes that are limited to $10,000 now and a loss of um, really a total of about $175,000. The net effect on this standing alone is a loss. The 529 plans are another topic that make a change and a benefit to a number of households that have children in private school, charter schools, religious schools in which they pay tuition. But it doesn't have a direct effect potentially on the 2018 tax return, but because it's a substantial change for in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I wanted to touch on it now. The change that was made is the 529 savings plan has always been used as a college savings fund and has been applied to qualified college costs, such as tuition, room, board, and anything that applies under the Internal Revenue Code's uh, definition. Now, that has been expanded to be used for K through 12 or kindergarten through 12th grade expenses, specifically for public, private, or religious schools. Any taxpayer can contribute um, up to, can contribute a, uh, a maximum amount per state's limitation. Each of these plans are funded and supported by the state that they are opened in. Each state has its own limitation that they have set for their citizens. The amount that can be taken out is up to $10,000 per beneficiary. So you can open up multiple accounts for multiple children. The children don't have to be your own children. They could be grandchildren. 
and any gains that accrue in those 529 plans are taken out tax-free. The goal would be, or strategically, you would want to put in a lump sum now, allow it to grow, and as that growth occurs over time, take out the gains to apply it to these qualified expenses. Putting in an amount to pay for tuition this year doesn't reap any effect, doesn't reap any benefit, or putting in the exact amount at the beginning of a school year and taking it right out doesn't, doesn't create the benefit it's intended for, which is to allow the funds to grow within the 529 plan and take out the proceeds tax-free or take out the gain tax-free to be applied to K through 12 expenses. Gideon doesn't have kids in private school and there's no effect. Likewise, Cassius, four kids in public school, and Reggie and Rachel, four kids in public school. When we look at Shelby, his kids' tuition is $9,450 each, four kids. And although we don't know the rate of growth, or, and it will be dependent on the market, the, gain, the, the net effect is a gain, because he'll be able to take out that gain tax-free and apply it to an expense that he already has. Same is true for the last example. The increased child tax credit is a popular change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act because it's now increased the tax credit to $2,000 per qualifying child and has created a refundable portion of $1,400. You'll see at the end of this presentation how that change is a market change that actually allows for a refund to a number of taxpayers that they will get as a check from the IRS. The phase-out amount has also changed from $200,000 to $400,000 for joint filers. The child must have a valid Social Security number now as well to claim the non-refundable and refundable credit, and that's a substantial change from the child tax credit previously. Gideon, he has four qualifying children for the child tax credit. That increase of $2,000 per qualifying child means that he now has a credit of $8,000 against his taxable income. Credits are a dollar-for-dollar dollar benefit against the taxes that you may owe. Credits are the things that you want on a tax return more than a deduction, because a deduction doesn't mean you get a dollar-for-dollar dollar benefit on the taxes that are going to be due. A credit, on the other hand, is a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit against the taxes that are owed. Likewise, Cassius, he has four qualifying children. That increase in the child tax credit gives him $8,000 of a credit against any taxes that may be owed, and $1,400 of that is refundable. Reggie and Rachel, they have a gain. Because of this increase and they qualify, they now get to apply $8,000 against the taxes that they owe. There's no effect to Shelby because there is an AGI threshold that you phase out of the child tax credit. At $385,000, even with four children and being in a single status, he's phased out of the child tax credit because of his AGI, so there's no effect. And likewise, the last example, their AGI exceeds the threshold and they can't claim it. For purposes of this presentation, to illustrate how all of these changes we have discussed will affect a tax return all across the country in different filing statuses with different income levels, I have put together these charts on the next few slides so that you can see how they compare. Now, for purposes of this presentation, I have used the term adjusted gross income, but not as it's used on your tax return. On the 1040 tax return, the adjusted gross income comes at the bottom of page one. Page two has your deductions and your credits which then result in your total tax due. Here, I've claimed your exemptions, your deductions, put your adjusted gross income, followed by your credits, and then your total tax due. Please recognize that this is just for illustrative purposes for the purposes of this presentation. When you look at Gideon, income being $35,000, single filing status for both years, although the personal exemptions were eliminated from 2017 to 2018, the standard deduction has increased. The 529 savings plan, I wanted to point out here again, it doesn't have an effect on the tax return per se, 
until the year where you take it out and you're able to take that gain without having to claim it as taxable income. Charitable contributions, because of the increase to the standard deduction, Gideon is not itemizing this year, but as we discussed previously, he wouldn't have been itemizing in 2017 because of the personal exemptions he would have been claiming. The adjusted gross income is a substantial difference. In 2017, it would have been $8,400, and in 2018, it's $23,000. Now here's the most important change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. The adjusted gross income is substantially less in 2017, but when we get to the bottom, we see that total tax due is zero, and in 2018, there's a $1,400 refund. When we look at the changes to the income brackets or the tax brackets, even at higher income levels, which as we compare each of these, you'll see that, even at higher income levels, the change to the tax due is not in proportion to the amount of the taxable income that is left after these changes uh, by repeals um, to some of the expenses that were able to be claimed before. In Gideon's case, total tax due was $840, 2018, total tax due is actually $4,009.52. But because of that increase to the child tax credit, now $8,000 was applied against that $4,009.52 that was owed, and he gets a $1,400 refund. Likewise, with Cassius, considering the income th being the same, personal exemptions lost in 2018, standard deductions increased, 529 plans, uh, not, having, uh, not having an effect on the return itself, not itemizing the return due to the increase of the standard deduction. The adjusted gross income turns out to be $23,400 in 2017 and $38,000 in 2018. I find this presentation or this part of the presentation to be the most interesting part when we look at the adjusted gross income and the increase of the adjusted gross income as it relates to 2017 compared to 2018. But when we get to the bottom line tax due, there's typically not an increase on some of these lower uh, incomes in households, such as this one, which is head of household earning $50,000 a year. Although the increase of the adjusted gross income is substantial, about $15,000 more, the total tax due is less than $2,000 more and ends up being a refund because of the tax, child tax credit, which has increased and now has a refundable portion. Previously, Cassius, $50,000 in Lexington, Kentucky, would have owed no taxes but wouldn't have received a refund check. Reggie and Rachel, $110,000 in Oklahoma City, 2017, they would have claimed the personal exemptions. 2018, it's eliminated. Standard deduction, they wouldn't have been claiming the standard. Likewise, in 2018, even with the increase, they're not claiming the standard. The 529 savings plans, as I indicated earlier, has no effect now on the 2018 return. The charitable contributions, because they're itemizing, they're going to claim all of it state and local taxes, assuming that they're going to stay the same for 2017 to 2018, they'll claim all of it. The mortgage interest has no effect on, the, on their mortgage, which was $250,000. The limitation under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act doesn't affect them, and they will claim all of their mortgage interest. Their adjusted gross income ends up being $54,797 in 2017 and $79,097 in 2018. This is an example where we can see how they'll end up owing substantially less even with a much higher adjusted gross income. And you see the benefit of that dollar for dollar child tax credit. With adjusted gross income of $54,797.71, their total tax due was $7,200 more or less. They had a $4,000 credit from the child tax credit and it still left them with total tax due of $3,300. Now, under the new brackets, even though their adjusted gross income is $79,000, the, 
their total tax due ends up being $9,200. They get an $8,000 child tax credit, and their total tax due ends up being $1,280, which is a $2,000 overall savings to this household. When we look at Shelby, there's actually an increase in the total tax due, and we'll see that in the last example as well. This one is interesting when we consider it's in Florida, there's no state income tax, so the limitations to state and local income tax shouldn't affect this tax return, and the property taxes were below that $10,000 limitation. The $385,000 income loses the personal exemption, I'm sorry, actually that should be who would have phased out of that personal exemption. The, uh, it's eliminated under the new law. The standard deduction, he's not taking the standard because he claims the itemized deduction. Doesn't have, the, uh, doesn't have qualified tuition in 2017, but in 2018 can contribute. The contributions are the same. They are still gonna be after taxes. It's only the gain that's gonna be tax-free. The charitable contributions, here, when I limited the amount by the P's limitations, I only applied it to the charitable contributions to simplify this example. So although really the P's limitations limits the aggregate itemized deductions, I just applied that number against the charitable contributions so that we could compare the two columns a little more easily. Charitable contributions limited by P's from 38,500 to $34,795 in 2017, and then, 38, and then in 2018 was able to claim the full $38,500. State and local taxes should have been limited by that $10,000 limit change in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but because Florida doesn't have state income tax and the property taxes come out to $4,235, he's able to claim the full property tax. Mortgage interest here, we consider that the mortgage, even though it's $800,000, was grandfathered in prior to December 14, 2017. Again, if it had been after December 15, 2017, this would have been limited to the $750,000 mortgage, and he would have been only able to claim interest on uh, that portion. Adjusted gross income ends up being a difference of about $20,000. Uh, a little less than $20,000, but the tax due is actually substantial. Adjusted gross income is in 2017 is $307,000, in 2018 is almost $324,000. Using the new brackets, the total tax due is 84,851 in 2017, and I'm sorry, using the new brackets for 2018 under the single filing status, total tax due is actually $90,355 which is an increase from what was paid in 2017. Not eligible for the child tax credit, so the total taxes due for 2018, considering all things remaining the same between 2017 and 2018, is actually an increase for this household. Four children, single filing status, $385,000 of income earned. And finally, for this last example, uh, and I had uh, imagined this would happen, which is why I used California, that limitation on the state income tax is substantial, which caps it at $10,000, and they have a substantial increase in their tax due. Earning $1.5 million, personal exemptions, they would have phased out, but that's eliminated under the new law. They don't take the standard deduction uh, in 2017, and they don't take it in 2018, even with the increase. They had, would have had no qualified tuition in 2017. Their children were in private school, not in college. But in 2018, now they can contribute their after-tax dollars to the 529 plans and take them out in the future and take that, take that gain tax-free. But has no effect on this 2018 return. Charitable contributions, again, I applied the P's limitations only to the charitable contributions for s simplification's sake. So we see their total charitable deductions of $150,000 on their 2017 return is limited to $114,414, which means their taxable income uh, is increased by that amount and it's decreased by 2000 in 2018 by uh, the difference. State and local income tax. Venice, California, state, in state income tax and property taxes in 2017 total $185,051.20. And in 2017, they could claim all of it 
limited by the P's limitation, which we've already applied, and in 2018, they can only take $10,000. This is one of the biggest differences we see, uh, and one of the biggest stories that came out from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was this limitation. Mortgage interest, again, assuming they're grandfathered in before December 14th, they can claim this is 4.75% uh, interest on a $1 million mortgage. So even though their home is, has a mortgage greater than that, they're claiming $1 million mortgage, 4.75% uh, interest on a $1 million mortgage. They could claim all of it in 2017 because we're assuming they purchased the house prior to December 14th, 2017, they're able to claim all of it in the, on their 2018 return and thereafter. Their adjusted gross income actually has a substantial difference. Their 2017 adjusted gross income, as we've seen in all of these examples, is less than their 2018 adjusted gross income. It's about 1.12 million in 2017, 1.29 million in 2018. Total tax due is 392,000. $208.10. It looks like this column uh, needs that number right there, but it's in 2018, they end up owing $417,000, which is uh, about a $20,000 jump, more than that, maybe a $25,000 $25, jump from what they owed in 2017. They're not eligible for the child tax credit, so that ends up being their actual taxes due with the return. $417,602.40. Now, although it is an increase, I would like to point out here that this last line, or this total tax due, is calculated by the changed tax brackets, and that's notable here as well. We have a substantial difference between the adjusted gross income, but when we get down to the total tax due, it's only about $25,000 difference in the total tax due, even though the adjusted gross income has increased substantially. That's due to the tax brackets changing to widen the range of income that falls within lowered tax brackets. Not everyone gets those lowered tax brackets. There's actually a small group of individuals who fall into an adjusted gross income who are going to end up paying at a higher tax bracket. And if you're that unlucky group, you want to earn more money or less money. <laughs> and uh, uh, fall right out of that. But this household actually ends up paying $25,000 more in taxes in 2018. So not every household has a significant gain from these changes. I should also use, I should also make the point that all of these examples, we consider them to be W-2 households. If instead any of these had been self-employed individuals, we would have recommended a different entity structure altogether, and they would have had different deductions to put against their income. Considering each one of these examples as a W-2 income earner, we were able to go through these examples as we have today in the presentation. If you know someone who has this type of entity structure and could instead be self-employed, there are substantial benefits in being self-employed under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. We will be getting to that in another presentation that we hope to bring to you soon. But for today, that's the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and some of the most popular changes that have been made that affect nearly every household in America. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the chat. We had a lot of people chatting in questions. So if you have any further questions or need additional clarification on any of the messages that you sent in chat, please feel free to email us with the emails on the screen. And thank you so much for being here again. Hope you have a good rest of your day, and we will all talk soon.